I, once I take that step back, I look over my shoulder and Mr. Rosenbaum, Mr. Rosenbaum was now running from my right side. Um, and I was cornered from in front of me with Mr. Zeminski. There were people right there. That's where I run. <laughs> Kyle Rittenhouse breaking down on the stand when he talks about the moments leading up to when he fired the shots that killed two men and wounded a third. Also tonight, the possibility of a mistrial looms the judge admonishing prosecutors for alluding to an incident the judge had previously deemed inadmissible. So what comes next? Alex Perez is in Kenosha for us tonight. Your money, Americans are feeling the pinch as prices surge. Tonight, the White House weighs in on inflation concerns and the move the IRS is making that could help you when you go to pay this year's taxes. Tonight with Thanksgiving and the holidays right around the corner, the COVID concerns grow. In Colorado, doctors are urging all adults to get a booster now. The state is reactivating crisis care protocols to handle the new surge of patients. The warning, this could be coming to where you live as well. The ABC News exclusive, the Santa Fe District Attorney details the investigation into that deadly movie set shooting, addressing those allegations of possible sabotage. The movie's chief electrician is also coming forward, claiming the production cut corners. How did live ammunition end up on this set? We don't have an answer to that yet. I know that um, some defense attorneys have come up with conspiracy theories and have used the, the, words, the word sabotage. We do not have any proof. Do you believe sabotage is a possibility? No. The cross-country storm soaking the west is now making its way east tonight. Hail, damaging winds, tornadoes, and possible snow. The communities that need to be on alert tonight. And we also take you to one of the world's natural wonders now in dire danger. The Great Barrier Reef under attack, cooked by rising temperatures. But there's a last-ditch effort to save this crown jewel before it's too late. It's a rescue mission to keep as much of the coral alive as possible. We need real and effective action internationally and in Australia on climate change and greenhouse gas emissions. Otherwise, the future of the reefs looks very bleak. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with the explosive moments in the Kyle Rittenhouse trial in court today and the high stakes gamble. Rittenhouse taking the stand at his murder trial to tell his side of what happened. The 18 year old breaking down when asked to describe the moments leading up to when he shot and killed two men and wounded a third in Kenosha, Wisconsin in August of 2020. But he was also defiant, saying, I didn't do anything wrong. I defended myself. And tonight, looming over those explosive moments, the possibility of a mistrial. Today, the judge gave the prosecutor a tongue lashing for alluding to an incident in front of the jury that the judge had specifically said would be inadmissible. The judge warning, don't get brazen with me. The stakes raised as the defense asked for a mistrial with prejudice, meaning if granted, Rittenhouse cannot be tried again. For more on the high stakes day in court and what comes next, our Alex Perez leads us off from Kenosha. Tonight, an explosive day of testimony. Jurors for the first time hearing from Kyle Rittenhouse himself about the night he shot and killed Joseph Rosenbaum and Anthony Huber and injured Gage Grosskreutz. A high stakes move from the defense to put Rittenhouse on the stand. So I didn't do anything wrong, I defended myself. Then this dramatic moment, the now 18 year old breaking down sobbing, unable to talk on the witness stand after he described encountering Rosenbaum, who he says was chasing him. Mr. Rose Rosenbaum was now running from my right side um, and I was cornered from in front of me with Mr. Zeminski and there were <laughs> there were three people right there. <laughs> the judge calling for a break. 
Rittenhouse also testifying that Rosenbaum threatened him before the shooting. Sorry for my language. He screamed, if I catch any of you alone, I'm going to kill you. Through testimony, the defense painting a picture of a young man who had been cleaning graffiti and wanted to offer medical help to those injured during the protests that followed the police shooting of Jacob Blake. I knew there was uh, protests, demonstrations, and riots going on. But in cross-examination, the prosecutor pressing Rittenhouse on his decision to go to Kenosha in the first place, whether he was expecting to be in danger when he showed up with an AR-15. Why do you need the gun when you go out there? Um, I, I need the gun because if I had to protect myself because somebody attacked me. Why would you think anybody would do that? I don't know and playing this video in court. Attempting to dismantle Rittenhouse's argument that he was in Kenosha that night to offer medical help. You're not a certified EMT. You're not an EMT of any kind. You weren't on that night, correct? Yes. So you lied to him, correct? I told him I was, I told him I was an EMT, but I wasn't. The trial abruptly paused and jurors removed after the prosecutor seemed to allude to evidence that the judge had previously banned. For the Don't get mind. brazen with me. Uh, uh, you knew very well, you know very well that an attorney can't go into these types of areas when the judge has already ruled. The trial resumed. Prosecutors playing videos of Rittenhouse at the protest and attacking his claim he shot Rosenbaum in self-defense. Rosenbaum never touched you in any way during that incident, correct? He touched my gun. He didn't touch your body in any way, did he? No. To use deadly force, you have to have reasonable fear of great bodily injury or imminent death. But in the end, how that's interpreted really is up to the jurors. open to interpretation he says alex perez joins us now alex uh, what more do we know about that defense motion for a mistrial yeah, Lindsay, so the defense filed for a mistrial with prejudice, which means there'd be no opportunity for a retrial. At this point, the judge says he's just considering that motion, but we don't know what his decision will be on that, Lindsay. And Alex, we also saw Rittenhouse break down on the witness stand. What was his demeanor like during other parts of his testimony? Yeah, Lindsay, we saw all of that uh, emotion from Rittenhouse on the witness stand. But before that in court, I can tell you he was uh, pretty somber most of the time during this trial, not saying much, taking notes here and there. Uh, the defense uh, has, uh, they finished with Rittenhouse, but they say they still have three more witnesses to call to the stand. Lindsay. Alex Perez, our thanks to you. For more on this striking day of testimony, we bring in ABC News contributor Shauna Lloyd from the Cochran Firm. Shauna, always good to have you on. Let's start with the defense's motion for a mistrial with prejudice. How likely are they to win that? And if they do, that, that essentially ends this case, right? Essentially, if it's granted, it does end the case. The thing with a mistrial is that it's a very high burden because it's a very drastic measure for a trial. Typically, a court is going to look to see if there's going to be a lesser me a measure, like, for instance, a curative instruction to the jury that will basically smooth over anything that may have occurred in trial. If they are going to have to show that there was substantial and irreparable damage and prejudice to the defendant before before a mistrial can be granted. Though in fairness, you really can't unring that bell once the cat is kind of out of the bag, even though you can instruct the jury to say, strike that, don't let that be part of your decision making. Perhaps they have been prejudiced, correct? Absolutely. I mean, it is hard to unring the bell, but certain things are much more prejudicial. If he had gone into the full entirety of the incident, that would definitely probably rise to the level of a mistrial. But, you know, alluding to it and then being cut off, I don't know if that rises to the level in this particular case, which is why I think the judge is being very cautious about granting this mistrial, because there is a curative instruction that he could issue to the jury for that, what was said today. Okay, let's take a listen to more of Rittenhouse's testimony. What was the risk to you of death or great bodily harm at the moment you killed Joseph Rosenbaum? If I would have let Mr. Rosenbaum take my firearm from me, 
he would have used it and killed me with it and probably killed more people if I would have let him get my gun. Mr. Rittenhouse says that Joseph Rosenbaum touched his gun but never touched him. And we also hear his claim that Rosenbaum could have killed him and others had he not shot him. Was that a strong self-defense argument? I think it's the strongest argument he has. Remember, we're always in the mind of the defendant when it comes to self-defense. Did he reasonably believe that he was in imminent fear of grave bodily harm? Or So when we look at this, we have to look at who he is, the position he was in, where he was, and what was occurring at that time. So it is subjective in some ways because we have to put ourselves in his shoes to make that determination. Then Rittenhouse also defended his killing of Anthony Huber, saying that Huber hit him twice with a skateboard and grabbed his gun. But the prosecutor drilled down on that. Let's take a listen. And when you shoot him, he's got his skateboard in his hand? Yes. You didn't see any gun in his hand, correct? No. You didn't see a knife? No. You didn't see a bat? No. You didn't see a club? No. All he's got is the skateboard, right? That he's hit me in the head with twice, yes. Okay. And you intended to pull the trigger at that moment with your AR-15, correct? Yes. That wasn't an accident. No. That was your deliberate decision, correct? Yes. And you knew that the way that gun was positioned, it, you were going to fire that bullet right into his chest, right? He was attacking me, so I pulled the trigger. And you knew that when you pulled that... Shauna, what do you make of that defense? That one is a little bit different. I mean, here we have the skateboard, which some could seem to possibly be some sort of dangerous instrument. However, we really have to look at the instance. Was he able to get away? You know, he wasn't at the time, although he had been hit twice, his vision wasn't impaired. You know, there are other things that people are going to look at and the jurors are going to look at when they make that assessment as to whether or not he could have gotten away, whether or not it rose to the level of having to actually shoot and and and, and hit someone in that nature. It really has has to rise to the fact that you believe that you are actually about to be harmed physically and that this type of force is necessary. And lastly, do you think that Rittenhouse helped or hurt his case by taking the stand? Interestingly enough, Lindsay, I think today it's going to go a little bit of both ways, I think, depending on the juror. I think seeing him on the stand, hearing it from his point of view, he was clearly very well prepared for this. He stuck to his speaking points um, initially, but seeing the raw emotion come out of him is going to humanize him to a jury. And there are going to be people that see him and see that emotion and see the panic that he was feeling on the stand and feel that maybe he did feel as though he was in danger. He had no other options. You know, he was on the ground. There was nothing else he could have done. So I think humanizing him to the jury is going to definitely appeal to some of our jury members. On the other hand, I also think that the very same emotion, the ability not to be able to compose himself, I think is also going to strike some jurors to say he didn't, if he doesn't have the emotional wherewithal to control himself, he should have really not been in a position to have the firearm in the first place thereby being in a situation that was as volatile as it was. So I think depending on the jury, this is going to slide a little bit on each side of the mantle, if you ask me. Points well taken. Shauna Lloyd, thank you so much. Always a pleasure, Lindsay. Now to the new report on surging prices. The Labor Department's Consumer Price Index shows prices were up 6.2% last month from a year ago. That's the biggest jump in more than 30 years of course, Americans have been feeling those rising prices for months, and inflation has become a major concern for the economy. So how long will the high prices last? Here's ABC's Stephanie Ramos. Today, the government reported the largest jump in consumer prices since 1990 for almost everything. Barbara LaFleur, a mother and grandmother shopping for Thanksgiving dinner, says she's seeing it. Starting with gas, and then uh, clothing in stores and uh, food. Um, restaurant prices, everything has gone up. Compared to this time last year, filling up your tank costs nearly 50% more and heating your home nearly 60% more. It's really crazy. I spent $350 a month on gas um, and it's a necessity. $350 a month is like a car payment. And food prices are skyrocketing. Steak costs nearly 25% more than last year. Have you noticed a, a difference in prices? Have you noticed them increasing? Oh, definitely. I forgot my bird. 
because I heard there was going to be a shortage, but I don't think there is, but they are much more expensive than they have been in past seasons, much more expensive. Late today, President Biden at the Port of Baltimore acknowledging Americans are feeling the inflation and pointing to the supply chain struggles contributing to that, promising to get to work on it. Many people remain unsettled about the economy and we all know why. They see higher prices and we're tracking these issues and trying to figure out how to tackle them head on. Lots to be unsettled about with regard to the economy at this moment. Stephanie Ramos joins us now. Stephanie, some economists had hoped that the rising prices would just be temporary as the country reopened. But is there any relief in sight? It doesn't look like it, Lindsay. Economists say you could, we can expect inflation to get worse before it gets better. And experts say this increase in inflation is costing the average American household about $175 a month. And as you can imagine, that could be an electric bill or a cable bill. And for those families that are living paycheck to paycheck, they are really feeling the pinch, Lindsay. And there is one small silver lining, though. I want to have a little bit of optimism here as far as these rising prices for those receiving Social Security benefits. Explain that to us. Exactly. So for those that receive Social Security uh, income benefits or supplemental security benefits, their payments are actually going to go up because consumer prices are going up. The Social Security Administration just announced a 5.9 percent income benefit uh, in, in, in 2022. So as you said, at least some good news coming out of all of this. We will take it where we can get it. Stephanie Ramos, our thanks to you. We turn now to the pandemic and health officials are starting to sound the alarm with winter soon approaching and as new cases and hospitalizations are once again on the rise. But vaccinations are picking up as well, including with children, with more than 900,000 5 to 11 year olds getting their first shot in the first week since becoming eligible. Here's ABC's Kana Whitworth. Just a week after those first shots for 5 to 11 year olds, the White House today announcing the country is on track to reach nearly a million vaccinations by the end of the day. Pediatric vaccination holds the promise of protection for our children, their families, and our communities. Vaccines for younger kids now available at thousands of sites across the country. But with colder weather moving in, COVID once again on the rise. And tonight, officials are sounding the alarm. Winter is coming. I mean, COVID is not taking the winter off. Cases creeping up in 20 states with hospital admissions climbing across 10. One of the latest hotspots, Colorado, where four counties have vaccination rates below 30 percent. Is that we're watching a train crash in slow motion and we know exactly what to do to keep it from crashing, but it still keeps going. Hospitals have activated crisis standards of care to handle more patients. 93 percent of ICU beds in the state are full. Tonight, the situation so dire in Colorado, they are stepping out ahead of the FDA by encouraging all vaccinated adults to get the extra shot. And is that something you are encouraging people to do? 100%. If you're over 18 and you're over six months since your second dose, please go get a booster. Doctors urging people to get those boosters, especially in advance of the holidays. Kana Whitworth joins us now from Colorado. And we heard those officials there encouraging booster shots for all adults ahead of the FDA recommendation. What do we know on the FDA timeline for authorizing these shots? Right, Lindsay, so we don't have exact timing here. The FDA is saying that they will make this decision as quickly as possible. The one thing we do know here is that they don't have to wait on a panel of experts to weigh in this time around. And we also heard some of those warnings from health officials there. What's the day to day like right now at hospitals in Colorado? Well, I have to tell you, Lindsay, so this is one of the largest hospitals here, and Dr. Zane said you cannot even imagine the amount of people that are inside the emergency room. He said they're crammed sort of in nooks and crannies, and I just want to read a few things that, to you that he told me. He said these are high-capacity emergency department patients. They need care. They're coming in all at once. They're coming in 24 hours a day, seven days a week for months on end now. He described it as skirting the treetops and went on to say what you're seeing is the breaking of human health care. Mm -hmm. So many concerned about those surges, not only there, but across yeah. the country. Kena, our thanks to you. 
Now to the toughest sentence yet in the January 6th attack on the Capitol. A New Jersey gym owner sentenced to 41 months for assaulting a police officer that day. It comes as a federal judge has denied former President Trump's claim of executive privilege to withhold his White House records from the January 6th Select Committee. ABC's chief Washington correspondent Jonathan Carl has the very latest. Today, Capitol rioter Scott Fairlam seen here posing with a police baton and with a pepper ball between his teeth, received the harshest sentence yet for any of the January 6th defendants, 41 months, more than three years in federal prison. Fairlam was the first to plead guilty to assaulting police officers. USA! Prosecutors USA! are now seeking a more severe punishment for the most high-profile rioter, 51 months, more than four years for the so-called Q shaman, Jacob Chansley, who marched through the Capitol with face paint and a Viking helmet leaving a threatening note for Vice President Pence in the Senate chamber. While the Justice Department goes after the marauders, the House January 6th committee is investigating what Donald Trump and his top advisors did to lay the groundwork for the riot and to incite the violence. Overnight, a federal judge ruled against Trump's efforts to block the committee from getting White House documents related to what he and his aides were doing before and during the chaos. The judge flatly rejected Trump's claim of executive privilege, writing, quote, presidents are not kings and plaintiff is not president. She called the January 6th investigation a matter of unsurpassed public importance that relates to our core democratic institutions and the public's confidence in them. Jonathan Carl joins us now from Washington. John, how critical is this case to the committee's work and, and how is the former president responding to this decision? I think it's central, Lindsay, to the January 6th committee's work. The January 6th committee, uh, to do this investigation and to get beyond what was done uh, when the impeachment managers impelled the second impeachment of Donald Trump, they need to get access to these records. They need to get new information about what was going on at the White House while the riot was going on and before uh, to see what Donald Trump and his aides uh, were doing potentially to incite the violence, to cheer the violence on, and of course, the, the parallel case here are the, uh, is the case against Steve Bannon, because the other thing the committee needs to do is to compel the testimony of Trump's closest aide. So what's Donald Trump doing? He's appealing. He's appealing and will continue to appeal. Most legal scholars, legal experts will say he's unlikely to prevail. But for Donald Trump, delaying these, uh, this investigation is almost as good as winning uh, this case, because this committee is really up against the clock uh, with the potential of Republicans taking over Congress uh, next year. This committee knows that they really need to compete their work uh, really by the latest, uh, by the end of the summer, by the end of next summer. Jonathan Carl, working up against the clock. We thank so much. Thank you, Lindsay. Next to the developments in the investigation of the deadly concert in Houston and the police chief pledging accountability. It comes as new videos are now emerging of the last moments of the concert as well as that deadly crush. And we do warn the images are disturbing. ABC's Marcus Moore is in Houston. Tonight, Houston's police chief saying Travis Scott and the production team behind Astroworld Festival could have stopped the concert. The ultimate authority to end a show is with production and the entertainer. Also revealing that authorities alerted the top levels of the production that CPR was in progress on several people in the crowd as the show went on Friday night. HPD personnel told necessary personnel of the performance in charge that CPR was underway on one or more individuals. They were told that. The chief saying Live Nation, the concert's organizer, was responsible for securing the mosh pits where fans surged to the front as Scott performed. <laughs> and tonight, our station KTRK reporting that after the show was stopped, Scott went to a party at a Dave & Buster's with rapper Drake, who had performed with him earlier. Sources say Scott was unaware of the tragedy and left when he learned of the eight deaths and dozens of injuries at the show. Marcus Moore joins us now. Marcus, you also have an update on those reports of individuals being pricked with needles who were at the concert. What's the latest there? Yeah, Lindsay, you know, that was a detail uh, early on that got a lot of attention and was quite startling. The uh, early reports were that a, a security guard who was on duty during the concert suffered a prick in the neck by someone with a needle. The police chief said that after interviewing that, that guard, uh, his injuries were not as a result of a needle, but from being hit in the head and knocked unconscious. Lindsay. Marcus Moore, thanks so much. 
When we come back, the French soccer player arrested, accused of planning an attack on a teammate. The reason why might surprise you. Our conversation with model Emily Rudakowski, her thoughts on being objectified and why she fears it's happening to females at far too young an age. But up next, our exclusive interview with the Santa Fe DA. Could there be sabotage and criminal charges filed after the fatal shooting on the set of the movie Rust? what being live is Three all seconds. about. Five, this is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people squeezing, squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not them. afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Oh. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Hi, <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. This is American history, a violent white mob, a brutal attack, 300 black Americans killed right here in America. Now, it is time to uncover Tulsa's buried truth, the gripping story brought to light in a new podcast from ABC News, available now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Sex, gambling, fraud, betrayal, and murder. Cutthroat Inc., the podcast. Me a the family truth. on a mission to find their son. A year's worth of conversations with the killer. Cutthroat Inc., subscribe for free now on your favorite podcast app. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. Now with so much on the line, more Americans are turning to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight than any other program across all of television. Welcome back. Major developments in the aftermath of that deadly shooting on a movie set. Russ, chief of lightning, lighting, has filed a civil lawsuit against the film's production company. This comes as the Santa Fe District Attorney, who is leading the investigation into the film set shooting involving Alec Baldwin, is speaking exclusively to ABC News's Kaylee Hartung, who files this report. So prosecutors have to deal in facts and in evidence. The Santa Fe District Attorney deciding whether to press charges after that fatal movie shooting in an exclusive interview with ABC News, now refuting claims by the attorneys hired to defend crew members at the center of this investigation. How did live ammunition end up on this set? We don't have an answer to that yet. I know that um, some defense attorneys have come up with conspiracy theories and have used the, the, words, the word sabotage. We do not have any proof. Do you believe sabotage is a possibility? No. Just last week, an attorney for the film's armorer trying to turn attention away from the 24-year-old in charge of all weapons on set. We're, we're afraid that could have been what happened here, that somebody intended to sabotage this set with a live round intentionally placed in a box of dummies. If it were to be found that this was a case of sabotage, would you be looking at a murder charge? A, certainly a higher level of murder charge than we would potentially be looking at with the facts that we have now, yes. The defense attorneys, we don't have the same information that they do, but until we have it in our hands, it doesn't play into the decision-making process. Mary Carmack Altwees is prepared to wait months for the investigation into cinematographer Helena Hutchins' death to be completed. But evidence so far suggests to her this tragedy was avoidable. 
I think the most concerning thing is that there were so many levels of failures on that set. Is it your understanding that more live rounds than that one were found on the set? Yes. Do you have an understanding of how many? I do, but I can't release that information at this time. Are you concerned as a legal matter about the other live rounds found on the set? Absolutely. We, we still don't know how they got on the set, um, and how they got there, I think, will be one of the most important factors going into a charging decision. It's probably more important to focus on what led up to the shooting, um, because the moment of the shooting, we know that at least Mr. Baldwin had no idea that the gun was loaded. So it's more how did that gun get loaded, what levels of failure happened, and were those levels of failure criminal? How much have you learned about Hannah Gutierrez Reed's qualifications to be in the job she was in? That's one of the areas of inquiry that we are certainly pursuing and that the detective that is in, in charge of this investigation is going to be asking her during her, her second interview. The chain of custody of the gun that fired the fatal shot has been called into question. Do you know who loaded the gun? We do, yes. The DA declining to say who loaded it. According to a search warrant affidavit, the assistant director Dave Halls handed the gun to Alec Baldwin, but his attorney on Fox News saying he did not. In the affidavits, it states that my client grabbed the gun off of a prop cart and handed it to Baldwin. That absolutely did not happen. And is it your belief that Dave Halls handed the gun to Alec Baldwin? Yes, that does seem to be the case. Authorities say nearly 100 people were on the New Mexico set when the shooting occurred. More than half have already been interviewed. Everyone initially was very cooperative, but adding in attorneys adds in an extra level of complication. We don't have laws that have been written for this kind of incident. There is no precedent for a case like this. Certainly not in New Mexico. Are you prepared to press criminal charges here? If the circumstances warrant it, absolutely. We will do our best to get justice for Helena Hutchins and Joel Sousa. Our thanks to Kaylee for that. Still ahead here on Prime, what Meghan Markle allegedly believed when she sent a letter to her father just before marrying Prince Harry and the new uproar about the couple. And how have children fared during the pandemic? We take a look by the numbers, but first our tweet of the day. Happy birthday to the U.S. Marine Corps. an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. World News Now. And America This Morning. The best new video. The breaking news overnight. Emergency crews called to the town of Surfside. U.S. airstrikes hitting targets in Iraq and Syria. The stories people are talking about. If you don't want to shave your legs, don't. I was just saying. Oh my. Got it. And what to expect in the day ahead. ABC World News Now and America This Morning. Starting at 2 a.m. Eastern. Up all night to keep you up to date. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. See why Sunday mornings, more and more Americans are now turning first to ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos. Welcome to This Week.
what being live is Bring all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by no people squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Welcome back, everyone. Now some good news to report about the mental health of American children. Our partners at 538 in Ipsos conducted a poll to see how children are doing nearly two years into this pandemic, and they found, to their surprise, that most kids are doing just fine. We take a look by the numbers. 89% of teenagers aged 12 to 17 said that their mental health was very good or somewhat good, while just 8% said their mental health was very poor or somewhat poor. In fact, more parents, 10%, reported poorer mental health than teens. 80% of teens said that they are only a little concerned or not at all concerned about their mental health, with 17% saying they are concerned or very concerned about it. And again, parents were more concerned about their children's mental health than the kids were. 96% of kids between the ages of 5 to 11 said that they feel very or somewhat good right now, which is certainly nice to hear. Another finding was that 30% of teens said their relationship with their parents has improved during COVID compared to just 7% who said that it had worsened. But many have lost connection with their peers. 29% of teens said that their friendships and social lives have worsened during COVID, but 27% said those relationships have improved and we still have lots to get to here our weather team is tracking the coast to coast storm heading east and our climate series saving tomorrow continues we travel down under to see the efforts to bring large sections of the great barrier reef back but first to look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. powerful stories of our time anytime nightline now streaming on abc news live 2020 true crime cinematic real life drama stunning the unthinkable follow the clues the hunt true crime 2020 now streaming on abc news live admit it these days what you need to know seems to change just about every day what is it that you really want to know need to know to help you not just get through your day but to make the most of it feel smarter feel better feel happier well how about a third hour of good morning america gma3 what you need to know now streaming on abc news live it's all about you all right here we go you ready Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is what being live is Bring all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by no people squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Thank you. 
18-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse taking the witness stand Wednesday in his own um, defense, breaking uh, down as he described <laughs> shooting Joseph Rosenbaum during August 2020 <laughs> protests in Kenosha, Wisconsin. That's right, bro. <laughs> The teenager has pled not guilty to shooting and killing Rosenbaum and Anthony Huber. Rittenhouse claims he was there to protect businesses and acting in self-defense with Rosenbaum threatening him. You said he threatened to kill you twice. Yes. But prosecutors are trying to convince the jury that Rittenhouse is guilty and had the intent to kill. The medical examiner who performed his autopsy says he believes the shot that killed Rosenbaum hit him in the back. Prosecutors argue Rosenbaum fell forward because of his injuries, but the defense claims Rosenbaum was actually lunging towards Rittenhouse to grab his weapon. The courtroom getting heated during the prosecutor's cross-examination when lead prosecutor Thomas Finger started to mention a video of Rittenhouse taken just days before the shooting, footage the judge had ruled inadmissible before the trial. Why would you think that that made it okay for you without any advance notice to bring this matter before the jury? In Georgia, it's day four in the trial of three white men charged with the shooting death of Ahmaud Aubrey. The unarmed black man was jogging through a Brunswick neighborhood last February. Defense attorneys have claimed that the men were worried about a recent uptick in crime in the neighborhood and thought Aubrey was about to rob a home under construction. Trying to wipe away tears of determination and of sorrow. The weather team tonight tracking that cross-country storm. Winds gusting over 60 miles an hour. Couple trees left thousands without power in the Pacific Northwest with heavy rain and snow to the north, severe weather to the south. Large hail and possible tornadoes in Texas and Oklahoma. The system moving into the northeast tomorrow night. Heavy rain expected from D.C. to New York to Boston through Friday. A London High Court heard arguments today from lawyers for the publishers of the Mail on Sunday who have launched an appeal in the high-profile privacy and copyright case that Meghan Markle won against the paper this past February. Jason Knopf, Meghan Markle's former aide who previously accused her of bullying, has provided a witness statement to the lawyers claiming that Meghan indicated in messages to me that she recognized that it was possible that Mr. Markle would make the letter public. Knopf also claims Meghan and Harry later authorized specific cooperation with the authors of Finding Freedom in December 2018. Megan denies ever speaking to or meeting with the authors of Finding Freedom and says she did not allow her letter to be published in People magazine or Finding Freedom. French soccer player Aminata Diallo arrested in Paris, accused of planning an attack on teammate Kyra Amrari in order to get more playing time. She was assaulted by two men last week, hit in the legs in front of her home, unable to play for Paris Saint-Germain last night, but is expected to recover. Diallo starting in her place. Squid Game creator Huang dong Yuk confirmed that he will make a second season of the hit Netflix drama at a red carpet event in Los Angeles. The popular show follows debt-ridden contestants playing schoolyard games in the hopes of winning a large cash prize. It has been watched by more than 110 million people internationally and became Netflix's most watched series launch. Huang says, it's all in my head. I have the basic storyline, the broad plan, so we're in the brainstorming stages. Netflix has yet to officially announce a second season. Welcome back. Emily Rudakowski has established herself as a multifaceted talent, entrepreneur, writer, actress, model, and activist. Her debut book, an essay collection called My Body is Now Out. I recently had a chance to talk with her about how sexual power is wielded in our society and her personal path toward harnessing that power. What made you start writing um, this collection of essays? So I didn't know that I was writing a collection of essays when I started. I would come home from dinner sometimes with friends and feel like I hadn't articulated an idea or thought about something in the right way or, you know, was interested in exploring something and would just sit in bed, honestly. So it was really kind of an organic experience of just wanting to investigate the experiences. So at the time that you decided, you know, I'm actually going to release this as a book, was it an attempt to take control back of your public image? I think it was sort of to set the record straight and also to become to become somebody who makes something. Um, definitely also about control, but as somebody who had always been sort of a one-dimensional, a lot of people are used to me as, a, as an image, seeing images of me, I, I wanted to give that image a voice. 
And, and you write at one point that your hypocrisy gave you a headache uh, with regard to when you were trying to, you know, kind of uh, sell your image with regard to bikinis and your Instagram hustle. What did you mean by that? Why did you feel that, that your hypocrisy was giving you a headache? Um, I had an actual headache, but um, I think that there have been a lot of moments in my career where I've wanted to to take as much control as possible. It's one of the reasons that I have my swimwear business. It felt like, listen, I'd rather be doing my own hustle than be working for someone else. Um, but at the same time, it, it felt and looked very similar to what I was doing for what I would be doing for someone else. So I think that, you know, knowing that I was putting images out there and kind of capitalizing on my body and knowing that people were going to continue and maybe, you know, perpetuating that narrative of I am just a body could, would, was very difficult for me and, and continues to be. And you're right about those clickbait headlines. Obviously, the allegations against Robin Thicke have gotten a lot of attention. But you say that at the time, you felt that you didn't handle it how you would have liked. If you were to go back to it now, how would you have handled it? I don't know if I would have handled it differently. I mean, it's one of those things where, you know, that was my big break. And I'm not sure that making a big fuss on the set of my big break would have served me in the long run. I don't know if I'd be here talking to you, having this conversation about my book. I do think that, you know, the onus is often on women to kind of adjust how they react and act. Um, and I wish that it wasn't always that way. I wish that our culture could, could change. And at one point you write about um, a young man in high school who you were dating who was forcing himself on you and you say that, that you wish that somebody had told you at that time that you didn't owe him anything. What is your message to, to young girls, to young women who are out there and, and you that, that perhaps you hope they'll take away from reading this book? Yeah, I think at one point when I was writing the book, I realized that I'd really developed this kind of yes man attitude of just um, never wanting to really have boundaries or talk about what made me feel comfortable or uncomfortable. And, you know, the industry really encourages that. Um, you never want to kind of complain about things because you're replaceable and being an agreeable model is kind of being good at your job. But I realized that I'd learned that even in, as a young person, as young as 14, sort of not to assert myself and to have agency. I think that, you know, I would tell a young girl that there's, you're going to say no and you're going to, you know, have limits and things that you don't want to do. And people are going to make you feel really bad about that. Um, and that's okay. And you have to be okay with their discomfort. Do you think that it takes sometimes exposing our vulnerability and being super transparent in order to ultimately be empowering? I think that um, for women, you know, they're, they're, the kind of vulnerability that I have in this book, I was really used to having it with my close female friends. And it takes a really long time for women to kind of let their guard down and start opening up and feeling like they can share the moments where they haven't been just super women all the time. And I want to see more of that in the world in general. And, and I know that you have said also that this is not your, you know, hashtag me too kind of book. Um, but I'm curious with regard to the industry at large and what continues to be the, the misogyny. Do you feel like um, all of the outside noise is starting to, to change the, the core of the industry? I don't know. I think that, um, there's kind of this weird fear now, like about being canceled, um, which, you know, maybe means that people sometimes behave more appropriately, but I don't think that that's an actual cultural shift. And lastly, for somebody who, who might see this book and potentially dismiss it, like, oh, this is just a book from a model. What do you hope that people would, would really lean into and, and feel like, no, there actually is some, some good content here to, to learn? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, this isn't a book of, about modeling. And obviously my industry, modeling, the industry of modeling revolves around um, commodification of women's bodies. So it's really specific in that way. But I think uh, the, the most interesting parts of my experience and I'm what hoping people connect to the most are the things that started way, way before I was modeling just learning to kind of value the way I look and what it means to be beautiful or, or you know, play that kind of game. Um, I think every woman can relate to that.
Our thanks to Emily for that discussion. Rising ocean temperatures and a surge in tropical storms have put tremendous stress on sections of the Great Barrier Reef in recent years. And mass coral bleaching events are lasting longer and happening more frequently. That's why a group of Australian scientists and tour companies are stepping in to cultivate new coral and resettle the organisms on desolate parts of the reef. ABC's Britt Clennett reports. It might look like paradise from above, but beneath the turquoise waves of the coral sea, picturesque views turn to the barren expanse of a struggling ecosystem. This is the reality of one of our world's greatest treasures, the Great Barrier Reef. This sprawling natural habitat is teeming with marine life, but it's the maze of coral, the heartbeat of the Great Barrier Reef, that sustains the life here. And that heartbeat continues to be under attack from climate change. Back-to-back -back coral bleaching events in 2016 and 2017, and most recently in 2020, have left their mark on parts of the reef where coral was too hot for too long and withered away. That's the research boat over there we're about to link up. Hello, how are you? Thanks for having us on board today. We meet marine ecologist Dr Peter Harrison and his squad of graduate students near Black Island Reef off the Australian coast, an area severely impacted by coral bleaching in recent years. We've lost so many adult breeding corals that the production of larvae is now compromised. So that's how and why we're intervening. The Great Barrier Reef stretches over 133,000 square miles, is visible from space and helps fuel area fisheries and tourism. Its importance is not in dispute, but for some in Australia, climate change is, despite the eroding state of the nation's prized ecosystem. Peter's team is hard at work trying to preserve a small coral community through their lava cultivation operation. Tell me about this project. What are we getting done today? So today is the culmination of a year of planning and using new styles of delivery of the coral larvae onto damaged sections of the reef. We collect some of the immense coral spawn that occurs at the sea surface and then we carefully transfer the eggs and sperm and the embryos that are developing into these floating larval culture pools that are anchored on the reef. Those larvae are now ready to settle. The team of scientists have tens of millions of microscopic coral growing in these pools. They're trying to emulate the natural brown clouds of coral spawn typical on the reef during this time of year. The spring-like weather conditions are ideal for breeding. That will change once the summer heat rolls through in the coming weeks. What we're going to do is pull the pools over to the back end of the boat here, raise them up and concentrate the larvae, get an estimate of how many million larvae there are. So what part of the process this are these larvae? So these larvae are now six days old, those ones, and those larvae are at a point now where um, they will want to settle, so that's why we're going to put them back on the reef now. A successful outcome from today will be a result of many more larvae settling on the reef and growing into new corals than is occurring naturally. Peter says his team's replanting efforts elsewhere on the reef have ushered in reclaimed ecosystems, demonstrating the resiliency of coral-dependent biospheres under stable ocean temperatures. We've been able to re-establish breeding coral populations within just two to three years. And those coral communities are now dominating what were really highly degraded reef systems. So we're very excited by those results. But Peter's small operation is only part of the solution to revitalise the countless reefs that are struggling in Australia's coast. Scaling up coral restoration efforts is a must. In 2016, we saw a 30% drop in coral cover across the whole Great Barrier Reef. They didn't slowly die of starvation. Two weeks, that's all it took? They, they cooked. And the temperatures that year were about three degrees centigrade and above the normal summer maximum. Dr Terry Hughes directs the Centre for Coral Reef Studies at James Cook University in Australia. He's been sounding the alarm on the devastating effects climate change is having on the Great Barrier Reef for years. We used to worry about the impacts of cyclones because they're quite destructive on corals. Now we wish for a cyclone during very hot summers because bleaching has become so commonplace that we now have weather forecasts that predict bleaching in the coming weeks. Hughes says public visibility of the reef's overall health is key, particularly from those whose livelihoods depend on it. 
The Great Barrier Reef today, after five bleaching events, is a checkerboard of reefs that are in good condition and not so good condition. The tour operators know the good spots and they're quite selective in where they take people right. to ensure that they have a good experience. Some tour operators have recognised that need of balancing a good experience with promoting sustainable reef stewardship. In 2019, Cairns-based Passions of Paradise began planting coral on damaged parts of Hastings Reef, in addition to running their tour operations for vacationers. There are some reefs we go to that are 11 out of 10, would absolutely blow your mind. Without a sustainable approach to our operation, we don't have anything to show people. And really what we try to do is make the information relatable and accessible. You know, you, you get a wide range of people, you get climate skeptics, and what we just try to tell them is every little bit helps. Every bit helps, but it's still not enough, as global greenhouse emissions continue to climb. In the coming years, the new challenge for researchers will be finding ecologically and socially responsible ways to breed heat-tolerant coral that's also cost-effective. We're not looking at seeding a, a few hundred or a few thousands onto the reef. It's likely that hundreds of thousands or even millions of corals will be required. But there's a lot of knowledge that we have to gain before we get to that point. Yeah. Back out on the water, Peter and his team are using the knowledge scientists already have on the inner workings of these organisms. In just one day, they successfully released more than three million coral larva, hoping each spawn finds a place to settle and thrive on the recovering reef. But it's a drop in the bucket, and Peter knows much more needs to be done to ensure the entire Great Barrier Reef can thrive once again in the decades to come. This is only part of the solution. It's a rescue mission to keep as much of the coral alive as possible now, while we hope for a really strong outcome from the climate meeting in Glasgow. We need real and effective action internationally and in Australia on climate change and greenhouse gas emissions. Otherwise, the future of the reefs looks very bleak. Britt Clannett, ABC News, Queensland, Australia. All right, thanks to Britt for that. Before we go tonight, the image of the day. Take a look at this selfie. It is a French balloonist attempting to break a world record by standing on top of a hot air balloon nearly 12,000 feet in the air over France. He achieved his mission. Quite a picture out of this world, not for anyone who is afraid of heights, that's for sure. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. And coming up in the next hour, more on that stunning day in court in the Kyle Rittenhouse trial. And the manhunt continues for the suspects accused of breaking into the home of a real housewife of Beverly Hills and then holding her at gunpoint. An extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The ladies you love. The hottest topics happening now. There's only one place to find it all. You guys are having the hard conversations. I love The View. The most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live.
Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. Welcome back. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. Today, the government reported the largest spike in consumer prices since 1990, and almost no item has been spared. The cost of gas, heating our homes, clothing, food, and much more, it's all it collectively increased 6.2% in the past 12 months. Federal prosecutors are seeking the most severe punishment yet for Jacob Chansley, more widely known as the QAnon shaman, seen shirtless and shaman seen shirtless and wearing a fur hat with horns during the Capitol insurrection. The Justice Department recommending a sentence of four years and three months in federal prison for his actions. Chansley, who pleaded guilty back in September, emerged as one of the most prominent figures from the riot. His sentencing is set for next Wednesday. And today, a U.S. District Judge gave final approval to the $626 million settlement for those impacted by the Flint water crisis. The award would be shared among tens of thousands of people, according to Sources payouts could start within 45 days and children affected would receive a larger amount than the adults. Now to the pandemic and health officials starting to sound the alarm with winter soon approaching and as new cases and hospitalizations are once again on the rise. But vaccinations are picking up as well, including with children with more than 900,000 5 to 11 year olds getting their first shot in the first week since becoming eligible. Here's ABC's Kena Whitworth. Just a week after those first shots for 5 to 11 year olds, the White House today announcing the country is on track to reach nearly a million vaccinations by the end of the day. Pediatric vaccination holds the promise of protection for our children, their families and our communities. Vaccines for younger kids now available at thousands of sites across the country. But with colder weather moving in, COVID once again on the rise. And tonight, officials are sounding the alarm. Winter is coming. I mean, COVID is not taking the winter off. Cases creeping up in 20 states with hospital admissions climbing across 10. One of the latest hotspots, Colorado, where four counties have vaccination rates below 30%. Is that we're watching a train crash in slow motion and we know exactly what to do to keep it from crashing, but it still keeps going. Hospitals have activated crisis standards of care to handle more patients. 93% of ICU beds in the state are full. Tonight, the situation so dire in Colorado, they are stepping out ahead of the FDA by encouraging all vaccinated adults to get the extra shot. And is that something you are encouraging people to do? 100%. If you're over 18 and you're over six months since your second dose, please go get a booster. Our thanks to Kena for that. And now let's go to NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida, where the fourth SpaceX mission to carry humans to the International Space Station is set to launch With tonight. That Falcon 9 is ABC's fully Victor Akendo is there, but the first, first we'll take stages. a live yeah, listen Kendo, as it gets set to take mind. off four astronauts. Grounded for nearly two weeks as a result of, of weather and medical delays here. Now on board there. As we are one minute, 20 seconds away from the takeoff. That next call out will be that Dragon is in countdown. Standing by now for that call. On board there, one German, three Americans. Heading to the International Space Station for a six month stay. SpaceX has now it launched three crews for NASA in the past one and a half years. Dragon this will be the fourth. All right, the final minute before launch. Just 47 seconds to go. Everything is Dragon, ready for an on-time launch today. Go for launch. Endurance countdown. Copies. Go for launch. Starting to become rather commonplace with the Ground frequency that SpaceX is launching is these rockets to the space Sorry. station. Launch window. But lots of excitement still nonetheless there in Florida and 20 seconds to lift off throughout the country. You want 15 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Ignition. And lift off. Got
exciting each time. And that's the call again, it is becoming more commonplace so these far. days. The site we're becoming quite familiar with. Pushing Dragon into low Earth orbit on the way to the International Space Station. Power and telemetry nominal. Stay in one throttle down. Losing the signal there a little bit. We are waiting to get that signal back. Getting ready to throttle the engines back up. I want to say it's an uneventful liftoff, but at the same time, this is exactly quite a magnificent event. And now we will go to ABC's Victor Akendo, who is live on the ground. Victor, tell us more about this mission. Lindsay, that was so impressive to see that in person, the Crew Dragon just lighting up the night sky here. Uh, what makes this mission pretty unique is that three out of the four astronauts in that capsule right now, on its way up to the International Space Station, have actually never been in space before. Now. They're rookies, but that doesn't mean that they have a ton of really, really impressive uh, experience and really impressive backgrounds, too. So you've got Commander Raja Chari, uh, Mission Specialist Caleb Barron, European astronaut Matthias Maurer, and then there's pilot Tom Marshburn. He's the only one who's been in space before. So they've got kind of a long ride ahead of them here. They'll be, uh, they're on their way to the International Space Station. It's about 22 hours. They'll be docking there at 7.10 p.m. Eastern tomorrow. Uh, and as far as the mission goes, this is a long duration mission. They will spend six months up there at the ISS. They're gonna be performing uh, a number of important experiments. They will be upgrading solar rays and they'll be performing a lot of maintenance. And the ISS will be pretty busy during that time too. At one point, they'll even be uh, welcoming a Japanese billionaire going up on a Soyuz rocket. He'll be spending 10 days up there. Again, Lindsay, this is the fourth time now that SpaceX has sent a crew up to the ISS. Lindsay? Uh, uh, Victor, give us a sense of what it's like on the ground there. We did he seem to hear a crowd chanting along with that countdown. Are a lot of people still coming? Again, this is starting to be a, a regular thing uh, in Florida in particular, but are, are people still, a large crowd still gathering to watch these, these launches? Lindsay, I think first things first, seeing a rocket go up into space that never gets old but you are right uh, the crowds are noticeably like a little bit thinner than what you're used to seeing here it is becoming more and more common um that said that was actually my first launch i've and I got to tell you, the whole ground here, it, it did shake for a few moments. It was uh, so incredible to watch that live, Lindsay. We can imagine. Victor, our thanks to you. Now to a wild day in court in the trial of Kyle Rittenhouse. The teenager charged with killing to and injuring a third person at a police protest in Kenosha, Wisconsin, back in August of 2020. Rittenhouse took the stand today, breaking down in sobs, but insisting that he was acting in self-defense. And the judge giving the prosecutor quite a tongue lashing over one line of questioning, leading the defense to call for a mistrial. Here's ABC's Alex Perez with the details. Defense will call Kyle Rittenhouse. Tonight, an explosive day of testimony. Jurors for the first time hearing from Kyle Rittenhouse himself about the night he shot and killed Joseph Rosenbaum and Anthony Huber and injured Gage Grosskreutz. A high stakes move from the defense to put Rittenhouse on the stand. So I didn't do anything wrong, I defended myself. Then this dramatic moment, the now 18 year old breaking down sobbing, unable to talk on the witness stand after he described encountering Rosenbaum, who he says was chasing him. Mr. Rose and mom was now running from my right side um, and I was cornered from in front of me with Mr. Zeminski and there were <laughs> there were three people right there <laughs> the judge calling for a break. Rittenhouse also testifying that Rosenbaum threatened him before the shooting. Sorry for my language. He screamed, if I catch any of alone, I'm going to 
kill you. Through testimony, the defense painting a picture of a young man who had been cleaning graffiti and wanted to offer medical help to those injured during the protests that followed the police shooting of Jacob Blake. I knew there was uh, protests, demonstrations, and riots going on. But in cross-examination, the prosecutor pressing Rittenhouse on his decision to go to Kenosha in the first place, whether he was expecting to be in danger when he showed up with an AR-15. Why do you need the gun when you go out there? Um, I, I need the gun because if I had to protect myself because somebody attacked me. Why would you think anybody would do that? I don't know. And playing this video in court. Attempting to dismantle Rittenhouse's argument that he was in Kenosha that night to offer medical help. You're not a certified EMT. You're not an EMT of any kind. You weren't on that night, correct? Yes. So you lied to him, correct? I told him I was I told him I was an EMT, but I wasn't. The trial abruptly paused and jurors removed after the prosecutor seemed to allude to evidence that the judge had previously banned. For the Don't get line. brazen with me. Uh, uh, you knew very well. You know very well that an attorney can't go into these types of areas when the judge has already ruled. The trial resumed. Prosecutors playing videos of Rittenhouse at the protest and attacking his claim he shot Rosenbaum in self-defense. Rosenbaum never touched you in any way during that incident, correct? He touched my gun. He didn't touch your body in any way, did he? No. To use deadly force, you have to have reasonable fear of great bodily injury or imminent death. But in the end, how that's interpreted really is up to the jurors. Our thanks to Alex for that. Next tonight, for the first time, we are hearing from the lighting director from the movie Rust, who says the bullet that killed the cinematographer narrowly missed hitting him. ABC's Kaylee Hartung has more. Tonight, for the first time, a crew member who witnessed the fatal shooting on that movie set in New Mexico is speaking out. What a terrible tragedy and injustice when a person lose her life on film set while making art. Rush Chief of Lighting, Serge Svetnoy, filing the first civil lawsuit against the film's production company and the crew members who officials say handled the gun, including Alec Baldwin. Svetnoy alleging the producers, including Baldwin, were negligent on the film, saying they attempted to save money by hiring an insufficient number of crew members to safely handle the props and firearms. The lawsuit claiming the scene the crew was rehearsing did not call for defendant Baldwin to shoot the Colt revolver, but only to draw the gun and point it in the general direction of the camera. The Santa Fe District Attorney telling Good Morning America in an exclusive interview there were multiple levels of failure on the set, saying it could be months before she's able to determine if those failures were were criminal, but she's already rejecting a theory from the attorney representing the film's armorer. Do you believe sabotage is a possibility? No. Last week, Hannah Gutierrez Reed's attorney saying the possibility of sabotage should be explored. If it were to be found that this was a case of sabotage, would you be looking at a murder charge? A, certainly a higher level of murder charge than we would potentially be looking at with the facts that we have now, yes. The DA also confirming more live rounds have been recovered from the set, in addition to the one fired by Alec Baldwin. We still don't know how they got on the set, um, and how they got there, I think, will be one of the most important factors going into a charging decision. Kaylee Hartung joins us now. Kaylee, so the DA said that this was not an act of sabotage. Is the armorer's attorney standing by his claim? Yeah, Lindsay, the DA says they have no proof that this was sabotage. But today we heard the armorer's attorney doubling down on his claim. He's calling for a full and complete investigation. And he says we are convinced that this was sabotage and that Hannah Gutierrez-Reed is being framed. Lindsay? Mm, okay, well, obviously they'll have to come forward with some proof and evidence of that. Kaylee Hartung, our thanks to you. Next to the Real Housewife star publicly talking for the first time about the terrifying moments her family's home was robbed last month. Janae Norman reports. Like there's Real Housewife of Beverly Hills star opening up to Extra for the first time about the violent home invasion that left her pleading for her life. I fought for my mine and my kids' lives, and I got lucky. I just kept thanking God that I got out of there, and my kids didn't wake up 
and they don't know anything about it. Dorit Kemsley revealing to extra special correspondent and fellow cast member Teddy Mellencamp some of the terrifying details of the moment in October when two masked men shatter a glass window, breaking into her Encino mansion as she and her two children were inside. They were very surprised to see me at home. They pushed me to the ground and they said, who else is in the house? I'm not going to use the curse words they used, but there was someone else that said, just kill her, just kill her already, just kill her. And all I could think was, I have to save these babies. I begged them and I begged for my life and I begged for their life. And I said, I don't care about any of it. Take it all. I don't care about any of it. You can have it all, please. I'm a mother. I have little babies. Please, they need me. Please don't hurt me. This on the heels of the Los Angeles police releasing surveillance video of the intrusion. Cameras capturing two suspects in hoodies hauling away what investigators say was $1 million worth of valuables stolen from inside, including handbags and watches. The reality star known for living large. Dory, do you buy every single thing? Every do you Every single piece. I'm, I'm really particular. I want to wear what I want to wear. And you pay retail for everything. Yes. But experts warn to be careful about flaunting your wealth and whereabouts on social media, possibly making you a vulnerable target for a crime. When you are sharing like your vacations and where you're at, like checking into the airport, you need to realize that you're not only putting yourself at risk, you're putting your, yourself and the people that are with you at risk as well. Good advice there. Our thanks to Janae. And still to come, as the Glasgow Summit continues, our conversation about faith and climate change. And you might remember that California House of Horrors case involving the Turpin family, 13 children that shook the world in 2018. The case was revealed after one of the daughters managed to escape and help save the rest of her siblings. Now she and one of her sisters, they are recounting their experiences for the very first time with Diane Sawyer. It's part of her new 2020 special event airing this Friday at 9 on ABC. Take a look. 13 siblings held captive by their parents the chilling discovery inside a family home. For the first time, a survival story like you've never seen. Hello? This is 911, do you have an emergency? I just want to leave from home because I live in a family of 15 and we have abusing parents. Now, finally hear from the family. My whole body was shaking. I couldn't really dial 911 because I'm sorry. I don't know how you had the courage. I think it was like us coming so close to death so many times. It was literally a now or never. If something happened to me, at least I died trying. Never before seen. My two little sisters right now chained up. Where are they chained up at? On the bed. What are your parents going to do when they find out you left? They're going to want to live to kill. No weapons in the house. I do have guns. It's locked up. How many kids do you have? 13. 13. Sarge, you got another room in the front right here with two kiddos in the bed. Stop me dead in my tracks. Starved, beaten, tied up. What do you know about why these two people did this to their children? 13 times over. There are cases that stick with you, that haunt you, and that's what we're looking at here. And every day did you wake up in terror? Sometimes people were chained for, what, months? Yeah. Months? Yeah. Unbearable. Yeah. Mother, she choked me, and I thought I was going to die. The only word I know to call it is hell. And what has happened since? People couldn't believe this. The public deserves to know. Staggering strength, courage, and the will to survive. The escape from horror. My parents took my whole life from me, but now I'm taking my life back. Oh my gosh, this is so free. Like, this is life. I want the Turpin name. Like, wow, they're strong. They're not broken. They've got this. Escape from a House of Horror, a Diane Sawyer special event, Friday night, November 19th on ABC, and stream on Hulu. 
All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is American history. A violent white mob. A brutal attack. 300 black Americans killed right here in America. Now, it is time to uncover Tulsa's buried truth. The gripping story brought to light in a new podcast from ABC News. Available now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. The mysterious boyfriend. What does he even do over there? Tell me everything. You'll be okay. No one knows about us. He's the chief executive and she's a kid. You have committed multiple federal crimes. I want to talk to my lawyer. The White House disposed of me like a piece of trash. And they will do the same to you. Impeachment American Crime Story, Tuesdays at 10, only on FX. Available now on demand. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again then. <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, <laughs> the darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money, that's all we do. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again then. Are you an IT? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, <laughs> the darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money, that's all we do. Sex, gambling, fraud, betrayal, and murder. Cutthroat Inc., the podcast. Me a the family truth. on a mission to find their son. A year's worth of conversations with the killer. Cutthroat Inc., subscribe for free now on your favorite podcast app. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. Now with so much on the line, more Americans are turning to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight than any other program across all of television. Welcome back. We're tracking several international headlines at this hour. Afghan pilots trained by the U.S. and other personnel are officially making their way out of Tajikistan on a flight arranged by the U.S. government Tuesday. According to one of the pilots, the group of roughly 191 evacuees are being moved to the United Arab Emirates. This brings an end to a three-month detainment that started when they fled Afghanistan during the Taliban takeover at the end of August. Anti-government demonstrations in southern Bolivia turned deadly Tuesday. Day. This after a three-day strike between police protesters and government supporters ended in clashes that killed a 22-year-old. Street vendors have been protesting in several cities in the country against a new law that they allege penalizes informal workers. 70% of Bolivia's informal economy is made up of street vendors, totaling about half a million people. Parts of Sri Lanka faced an onslaught of heavy rainfall causing floods that killed at least 25 people, according to the country's disaster management agency. Thousands were affected in 17 of the nation's 25 districts. Roads were washed out, some houses destroyed, and hospital wards were filled with water. The rain is expected to taper off in the next two days as the storm continues to move throughout the region. While world leaders gather in Glasgow for COP26, there are other stakeholders who are making their voices heard. One group attending virtually is the Episcopal Church of the United States, which is calling on all participants to reach the goals set at the Paris Accords in 2015. Here with more about the Episcopal Church's priorities is Reverend Michael Curry, who is presiding bishop. Welcome back to the show, Bishop Curry. Thank you. Good to be back with you. So many people don't associate the Episcopal Church or even organized religion as being involved in the fight against climate change. Why has the Episcopal Church gotten involved in COP26? 
Well, um, the Episcopal Church has been involved since the Paris uh, COP conference, um, um, as have other traditions. Um, and it's uh, it comes out of a commitment that actually is tied to our religious convictions. In the Hebrew scriptures, the psalmist says, the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. Um, in the, the Christian New Testament, in John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That and, and then, of course, obviously, the story of creation at the very beginning of the Bible. Um, these are part of the tradition. This is deeply part of the faith to care for and to cherish the creation that God has made. Add to the fact that we all live here and we all have a stake in it because we're all here. Take a religious conviction and the fact that we are human and have a stake in caring for the earth, and it only makes sense that our religious traditions um, really engage in the work um, of climate, of, of reducing and ending climate change so that this earth is habitable, not just for us now, but for generations yet to come. And as you've said before, climate change not only hurts the environment, but it also exacerbates existing injustices. How so? No question about it. Um, while we are all, if, if you had asked the average American just 15 years ago, what are the impacts of climate change on your life? We probably would have stumbled around for answers. Um, um, but now the average American, the average person knows we have seen the severity um, of, of weather. We've seen the severity of hurricanes, wildfires, and um, even tornadoes in the middle of the country. That, that the unpredictability and the difficulty we're seeing in weather patterns, that's not just a matter of weather, that's climate change. Um, so we are experiencing it ourselves. But the truth is the most uh, impacted um, indigenous peoples, um, uh, people who are tied to the land, um, people, uh, uh, poor people, we will see more mass migrations unless uh, migrations of people looking for food. Um, the, the growing seasons have grown shorter in parts of the uh, country, uh, parts of the world. Um, these will have impact on the poorest of the poor as well as on all of us. But how do you answer that cry? Because among your priorities, it's to help victims of climate change cope with loss and damage and, and shoring up communities at risk. But what specific actions can the Episcopal Church take to help these communities? Well, in a variety of ways. On the one hand, um, churches and people of faith can advocate. And so advocacy with our governmental leaders on all levels, um, national, state, local, to advocate for policies that reduce carbon emissions dramatically, to advocate for policies that, that do things to um, repair loss and damage uh, for people who are affected um, by changes related to, to climate change, to advocate um, to do that. We also have something that we, we can do ourselves. Um, churches and communities eating, um, you know, church folk eat a lot of meals. I don't know about uh, <laughs> all religions, but I know church folk where I come from, they eat. Um, so let's eat locally sourced foods. Um, uh, there are groups like Interfaith Power and Light that assist churches and individual Christians and people assessing the energy use of your home. What is your carbon footprint? And what is your impact um, um, on the environment? We can do some things as well as advocating for our governments and for our corporate entities to do their share uh, to help to save Mother Earth. Yeah, so not just feeding those bellies after the church service, but, but feeding the earth, feeding the planet back. The scientific consensus around climate change is clear. The UN's most recent climate report concluded humans are unequivocally warming the planet. What advice do you have for finding some common ground between science and faith when talking about climate change? Well, it's right there. It's right there. The common ground is that when the, you know, there's a, uh, in the story of Genesis, uh, the creation, um, uh, some of the old translations of the Bible spoke of human beings having dominion. Well, the meaning of that, the word that was used there for dominion is actually to be caretakers, to be trustees, to be stewards. For us to realize that we are stewards of this creation, that we're meant to care for it. Um, this is God's word, world. We're meant to care for it. And the scientists can help us to understand how can we care for it? How, what, do, what can we do to both mitigate 
mitigate and to reduce the impact of climate change? Um, what can we do to purify the air and the water um, so that the earth is habitable for all? That is where the values of our religious tradition and the knowledge of our scientific traditions come together in common cause. Oh, we've got a common cause. We've got common work to do. As someone once said, look, we all inhabit the same planet. We're all in this together. Indeed, we are. You know, so many people pray for themselves, pray for wisdom, pray for other people. Do you in particular pray for the Earth? And, and, and not only that, yes. but I, I guess I would also ask you, what gives you hope tonight about our planet's future? You know, I actually do. I, I can't say that I always did. I didn't <laughs> think about it 10 years ago in this way. This is something that I've learned from um, our Native American, indigenous peoples here, who have a very keen sense of the sacredness of the creation and of the land. Um, and, and I'm learning from them that, that we, if we love the creator, we must love the creator's creation. Um, and, and so we're working on um, incorporating prayers and um, inviting people to pray for the creation, to pray for um, human beings that we will find a way to be truly stewards and trustees of God's world, um, not to exploit it or to misuse it. Um, and that all of that is part of consciousness raising. I remember I was in high school when the first Earth Day happened, and I remember not really understanding why we were having an Earth Day, but I can tell you you from the time of that first Earth Day until now, our consciousness of the environment has increased dramatically. And we must now move from not only consciousness of our impact and of the scientific ways we can help it, but we must move to a spiritual understanding that, as the Bible says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And we must care for it. If we love God, let us love the world that God loves. And that is a spiritual message and commitment that has practical outcomes and results. Amen. And that gives me hope. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> I feel like we've gotten fed. You know, we need to, to kind of pass the, the, the plate, get some offering going every time we hear from you. There we go. <laughs> Bishop Curry, we thank you so much once again for joining us. God bless you now. Thank you. And that is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to